The Air Force Research Lab is a scientific research organization dedicated to leading discovery, development, and integration of aerospace warfighting technologies. They are designated as the Quantum Information Science Research Center for the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Space Forces. Their mission includes planning and executing the Air Force Science and Technology Program and providing warfighting capabilities to U.S. Air, Space, and Cyberspace Forces. Approximately 10,000 military, civilian, and contractor personnel support the AFRL mission. We are honored to have an AFRL senior leader here with us today. Please enjoy this next keynote. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jackie Gamblin. I'm the CEO and founder of JYG Innovations. I also serve on the Dayton Wright AFSIA Chapter Board of Directors. Um, so currently I'm serving as the endowment chair and I wanted to share a little bit of information to you about what your sponsorships and donations have meant to our community. Uh, we currently are at a total of almost $600,000 that we have contributed in scholarships and grants to undergraduate programs and K through 12 STEM initiatives. So if you could please give an applause uh, for the work of our chapter. It's my pleasure now to introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Christopher Ristich, who is the Senior Executive Service Director for Air Force Strategic Development Planning and Experimentation Office, or SDPE, and is the Transformational Capabilities Office, or TCO, at the Air Force Research Laboratory. Prior to his assignments in the SDBE office, Mr. Ristich served as Technical Director of the AFRL Plans and Programs Directorate. There, he was responsible for establishing and shaping new engagements with the Secretary of the Air Force, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and Commanders of the Air Force Major Commands, to integrate science and technology into Air Force corporate processes. Mr. Ristich's career includes more than 30 years of experience in research development and test and evaluation of Air Force, Army, Navy, and joint programs. He has provided leadership and technical expertise in programs that span air, space, and cyber domains. Please welcome Mr. Chris Ristich. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to, to meet with you all today. Um, as, the, as the slide says, uh, and, and if you heard from the introduction, I'm actually dual-hatted, a director over two different organizations in AFRL now, both of which will actually kind of tie into the discussion that I have for you today. But the primary focus is on the Transformational Capabilities Office that we've established in AFRL. And the, 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 the story I want to I I tell, tell you is, is how we're responding to changes in the technology and, uh, and, and threat landscape uh, across the globe. So first, there's been a tremendous shift in the research and development um, um, tied essentially across the globe, as you know. Uh, at one point in time, the DOD was, the, was the, the primary source of research and development in the world. Um, now, not only is the DOD not that, the U.S. as a country is about to s fall behind China in terms of research and development investments, uh, as well as some you know, major investments around, uh, around the globe. Um, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the national threat assessments for 2021, they continue uh, probably the same things that you hear and read in the, in the newspaper today. Um, uh, a growing near peer in China, um, Russia that continues to um, uh, resurge and push back on Washington, uh, and challenges, constant challenges, frankly, with, with both Iran and, Nor and North Korea. So significant shift in the thread, uh, the threat, and as China becomes a greater and greater uh, peer, uh, eventually surpassing us, you know, we predict, uh, it makes the challenge for us extremely difficult. And then if you look across the bottom of this slide, it kind of shows um, a lot of the different evolutions that are also affecting how we, how we make investments in technology. So faster development, things, 
Things like space, commercial space, for example, uh, incredible uh, explosion in capability in both space launch and in space-based capabilities. So things like, uh, uh, obviously, SpaceX being one of the most prominent ones in that and, and the ability to get things into space in, in a far more affordable way than ever before. And, uh, and things like commercial, commercial internet that is coming from low Earth orbit. You know, uh, um, SpaceX is one, but there are actually a number of vendors out there and more that are looking to, to enter the fray. And we can, it, it kind of changes the landscape for us because we really have to learn how to be much faster at adapting to these kinds of technologies. It's the same issue, you know, that we're, we're kind of here today to discuss. There's a lot of opportunities um, to take cutting edge technologies and bring them into the Department of the Air Force. And that's, that's the challenge is how do we do that and do that quickly. So I've, I've got an example there, a picture of, of electric vertical takeoff and landing uh, uh, aircraft. That, that's an emerging, um, emerging tech area that the US is trying not to lose to the rest of the world. Um, and it has, it has the ability potentially to change how we move personnel and equipment around on the battlefield into the near future. So we're looking at how to exploit that capability um, and changing strategies. So you, if you've been watching over the past few years, the U.S. has had a, a major shift in its national defense strategy and more is, is, is coming in terms of interim guidance there. But even specifically, home to AFRL, the research lab, there's a science and technology strategy that was released by the Secretary of the Air Force two years ago. And I'm going to show how much of, uh, much of the change that's evolving in, in Air Force Research Lab is coming from that document and from the, the strategy and the strategic thinking behind that document as well. Um, and of course, the stand-up of a new service within the Department of the Air Force now, the U.S. Space Force. Um, all of these things are fantastic for the nation, but they create challenges for us in terms of how we ensure that we are providing the necessary support to those both services. Um, our commander, General Pringle, her, her, her mandate is we are, one, we are one laboratory supporting two services, and, and we're working very hard to make that a reality. And then changing landscape, even within the, the air domain, the Air Force part of the Department of the Air Force, um, there's significant change that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit here. But um, it, just in, in the last six years that I've been watching, major planning in the Air Force has shifted from, from a vehicle that we called Enterprise Capability Collaboration Teams. Some of you may have heard of them, ECCTs. They were looking at these, these once a year chief of staff of the Air Force sponsored studies that were looking at the greatest challenges to leadership. So how do we ensure air superiority in the year 2030 and beyond, for example? It's a very difficult thing to do with a, with a, with a, peer, a peer level nation. Um, and, then, and then four years ago, so six years ago, ECCTs, four years ago, we changed to the Air Force Warfighting Integration Capability, AFWIC, and now in the past year, AFWIC itself is morphing into a broader organization called Air Force Futures. So um, very challenging threat space to navigate here and a, and a rapidly evolving ecosystem within the Department of the Air Force in which to make those changes. So we've got, we've got a real challenge ahead of us here. So we're, we're responding with a holistic approach in AFRL. And you're going to see, if you're familiar with the laboratory, you're going to see that, that embedded in this discussion and, and in the four organizations you see on this chart, there's a, a significant change that, that's, that's really happening. Um, one, uh, you know, most of you probably, if you're familiar with AFRL, you think of it as a foundational science and technology uh, organization that is typically focused on, on um, uh, how, we, how we address the gaps of our major commands across the Department of the Air Force. Um, but but the, the, the shifting landscape that I showed you on the previous chart is really driving us to much more significant changes. Um, within AFRL now, we have, the, we have the Transformational Capabilities Office, which I'm going to focus on for much of the rest of this briefing. Um, but we also have the integration of AFWorks, which is now looking at disruptive, pr primarily dual-use technologies in industry. Um, and then, uh, and as the introduction said, the strategic development planning and experimentation is all about operational experimentation to understand the military utility of concepts that are coming not just out of the laboratory, but out of other, uh, other sectors of the department as well. And uh, I'm going to paint a picture for you of how these are kind of holistically working together to create change in, in not only AFRL, but in the Department of the Air Force as well. 
So I mentioned uh, the TCO was stood up uh, in response, frankly, direct response to the science and technology strategy that was signed out in 2019. That strategy, which is uh, out in the open and available for anybody to read, uh, it called for a significant shift in the portfolio of AFRL, moving, moving funding and focus to what it called transformational capabilities, um, things that would allow us to you know, lead to demonstrations that test the viability of leap ahead capabilities. Um, and and it, 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 it mandated essentially that we do that in a different way, we, different way from the way we maintain our technical uh, depth, our core competencies, if you will, across the, across the laboratory. So the result was the stand up of the TCO. Um, and frankly, it was modeled uh, uh, after that bottom organization. So SDPE was an organization, although focused on experimentation, the, the, the basic premise of that organization was find the best solutions uh, everywhere and, and, and validate the military utility of those capabilities and bring them into the force. Find, uh, find ways to rapidly accelerate that capability. TCO extends that now not just to mature capabilities and technologies, but to science and technology. And so we actually go deeper into the portfolio. And by aligning these different pieces, these different elements, these business uh, modules, if you will, of AFRL, we're creating a very powerful capability. I'm going to kind of walk you through an example of, of, of one, one of those aspects. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about the Skyborg program. You um, may have heard about it in the news. It gets a lot of press, sometimes more than we want. Uh, but I'm going to pull a thread and illustrate how these different AFRL um, business uh, entities modules essentially are delivering capability along the, along the Skyborg front. So of course, first and foremost, it is about developing uh, cutting edge technology and transitioning that capability. So when we talk about vanguards, vanguard programs like Skyborg, the, the fundamental goal is to, is to transform the future force and, and transition the capability, right? We are, that is the, their major efforts focused on transitioning new capability to the Air Force. And, and again, for the first time, uh, at least formally, the, the focus is on the future force, not, not evolving our current major commands and our current warfighting capabilities, but really that leap ahead to what is the future force of the Air Force, the Department of the Air Force need to look like, and how do we get to that? How do we enable capabilities that, that get us to, to that point? All right, so complementary investment. So what is Skyborg exactly? Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's an autonomous, uh, low-cost vehicle architecture which enables the Air Force to posture, produce, and sustain multi-mission sorties at sufficient tempo to produce and sustain combat mass. All right, that says a lot, right? What, what, what we're really saying is, and I'm going to dig into this a little bit deeper in a moment, it's about how we take unmanned systems, team them with manned capabilities, uh, and do it in a very flexible and affordable way to generate mass on target, to generate uh, ISR, to generate um, communication nodes, uh, many, many different uh, applications that the technology can provide, but it's about leveraging our current capabilities uh, and, and, and getting a force multiplier, if you will, um, for the things that, that we're, we're trying to do and generate for the, for the future force. Um, this will be an incredible, uh, incredible capability that we deliver. Uh, there's, it's a very high risk program, very, very great challenges, but we're also making some really significant progress on this. So let me pull, uh, pull a thread, essentially kind of walk you through how these different, these different uh, components of AFRL are kind of coming together uh, to form this. Uh, when we're talking about technology at, at the edge for Air Force or Space Force, it's not something that happens overnight. This is, this is something that is, is the result of years of investment of technology and, and as I'll show you in a minute, in many, many different uh, technology areas. Uh, years of foundational science and technology that had really had to come to play to support this capability. So looking at, at uh, basic autonomy, both uh, at the platform level, at the subsystem level, at the mission system level, um, open architectures, of course, to create that flexibility and that ability to rapidly adapt these systems in the future. Um, low cost structures to make them affordable so that we can generate these in mass. And, and, and of course, because the idea here is, is teaming, how do, we, how do we create effective human machine teams? And, and what do those human machine interfaces look like? 
and so on. So many technologies, I'll, I'll dive into them in a moment here. But all of, all of what Skyborg is, is building off of foundational technologies that we've been investing in um, for years, and in some, case, some cases, even decades. And this chart, this kind of shows that progression. Uh, from on the left side there, you see uh, all of the different subsystem components that I just talked about, radios and, and um, data links and sensors and vehicles and so forth. Um, all of those began their life as independent science and technology investments within the laboratory. Um, the key then is how do we integrate them? And, and integration itself is a very difficult thing. I'm sure many of you know that. Um, but that is, that is really the objective of the vanguards is, is harvest these very, these maturing capabilities to create disruptive and transformational capabilities. Um, you'll notice we don't have a lot of vanguards. We have four. Um, there's a reason. They're, they're very significant um, investments and uh, challenges. Um, they, they will not represent, uh, will never have, or I don't anticipate having a large number of these, but the intent is that they be strategic and impactful and help us get over the, the valley of death. I mean, that really is the challenge here, right? Many of you are familiar with that term. It's that, uh, it's unfortunately where we have a really great idea, we get that technology to a certain degree of, of technical maturity and have a very difficult time getting it over the line to transition. Vanguards are all about the enterprise of the Air Force coming together and saying, this is very important to us. We need this for the future of the department and we're committed to making this happen. And that's where we are with the vanguards that we have today. So now uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the Skyborg program itself. Of course, Skyborg itself is what we call a transformational science and technology program, a vanguard, uh, under the oversight of the TCO. So even though the TCO, Transformational Capabilities Office, is a small office, uh, we are managing the actual vanguards of the, of, of the department. Um, but we're doing that as a team, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, but the, the Skyborg program, something that's equally important is it also has a component that is all about operational experimentation. And um, I'm really passionate about this one. So uh, I, I consider Skyborg to be you know, a two-sided coin, essentially. One is about the, the technology development. The flip side is about the experimentation part and how we build an understanding and trust of the autonomy that's, that's being developed, still being developed, by the way, um, and, and break down the barriers of getting these kinds of systems into the field. Um, so in, in this model now, you can, you can start to see all three of these different business models coming together. The foundational science and technology that's driving capabilities into it. The TCO that is, that is, is taking the baton essentially and, uh, and integrating these capabilities. And an independent operational experimentation arm of AFRL that is taking it to the next step and actually bringing out into the field, experimenting with it, bringing operators into that mix and having them understand uh, and shape, in fact, the, the concepts of operations that will drive these. So if you're not familiar with it, you know, having a widget is one thing, but you got to have con ops, concepts of operations to actually implement them and use them uh, or they're not ready for, for the fight. So that's a key element of, of how we do this. But the other thing I want to emphasize is what you see on this chart is not a simple serial handoff process. Um, the, the, the integrated team that is Skyborg is actually formed of, of many of the subject matter experts that actually created the individual technologies together with program managers in the Transformational Capability Office and partnered with experimentation partners in Speedy. So um, all three of those elements are, to, are together as part of the integrated team. And in fact, it's even more than that because I'll show you in a minute when we talk about, uh, about transition, it's about bringing the, the program office actually into that mix as part of the team too. This is, this is a recipe for transition that uh, I, I've really never seen anything like this. I, we mentioned I've been in the laboratory itself for uh, several decades. Um, I've never seen any, any opportunity like that. And, and we're looking at, you know, if you look at these different organizations, if you're familiar with, with the, the, the levels of funding in AFRL or in any science and technology, we have, uh, we, have we range from basic research to advanced technology, develop, <coughs> advanced technology development. Uh, and even in, in, the, in the SDPE case, 
beyond that into operational uh, experimentation and prototyping at, at what we call the 6-4 level. So um, we're looking at investments from 6-2, 6-3, 6-4, and all integrated to deliver future force capabilities. That is something that we, not, we really haven't had the, the ability to do. Um, this particular program, we'd like to highlight it because, frankly, we think of it as, as kind of a, a, a model for future vanguards, the, the ability to work um, holistically across the laboratory and together with our transition partners. So I'm, I called it a two-sided coin, right? Which I guess most are really right. But the uh, the front side of that is the tech development part, the vanguard proper, the part that that you uh, hear a lot about in terms of its technical objectives. Um, so Skyborg is integrating all of these independent component technologies uh, to enable the Air Force to operate and sustain these these teamed aircraft, if you will, uh, generating combat mass through uh, a family of sy systems that's supported by a transferable autonomy. Foundation, and I'll talk more about why, why that's important. The Autonomy Foundation is really an autonomy core system, an ACS. So we're building, we like to call it the, the brain, essentially, right, of, of, of Skyborg. And, and if we're successful, when we say transferable, this family of systems becomes really powerful when you can take that autonomy core and start extending it to other systems very rapidly. That's where scale starts to make a big difference. Um, and where we can get a competition of ideas and a diversity of missions from industry as well and, and utilize that same fundamental autonomy core system. So, uh, and then all of this is, is of course built off of a foundation of open mission systems and digital engineering as well. And then the flip side of the coin, the operational experimentation part, um, when you look at the, the, you, the military utility experiments that SDPE is executing, uh, it, a key part of that is really getting that early warfighter involvement that I mentioned before, building confidence for technology transition and helping to develop the concepts of operations for flying these actual systems uh, in the autonomy core system on different platforms uh, to validate that portability. Uh, you've seen that, if, if you've seen the, uh, the headlines, we've actually demonstrated the ability to take that evolving autonomy core system. So remember, it's still under development. It's going through a you know, 0.5, 1.0 plus kind of uh, iteration and evolution. And as that autonomy core system grows, we're able to continue to experiment with it in, in operational conditions. And, and one of the things that is uh, especially important about it, in, in addition to, to sort of breaking down some of the barriers to test and operate with these, um, is getting, uh, and, and getting the test ranges a lot to actually allow you to bring them out there, um, it, it really is, um, it's providing a, a very powerful uh, foundation of, of confidence in the capability. And I think that's going to be really important when we talk about transformational things. It means we're doing something very different. And it means that uh, it, there's going to be a, a barrier to overcome in terms of getting adoption from, from the major commands, the warfighters of, uh, of the Air Force. Um, the other thing I, 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 that I'd like to highlight about this particular series of experiments is What's fascinating about it to me is it, it's kind of like taking uh, autonomous systems, one that happens to be growing because it's getting smarter all the time, um, and, and running it through undergraduate pilot training. It, it's, it's teaching these systems, uh, and, and it's teaching us too in, in the, at the same time, but uh, helping us learn how to operate the systems from, from takeoff to ingress, you know, conduct their missions, um, have multiple handoff potentially to different human machine partners and bring those capabilities back ultimately um, to home base. So all of those are complexities that you, you may hear a lot about UAVs flying and autonomous systems, semi-autonomous systems. Um, that full life in the operational, um, the operational world of, of these kinds of unmanned systems uh, and autonomous systems has never really been been broken down before. So this is this is groundbreaking and really critical to to transitioning the capability. Okay, and I mentioned this a little bit before too, but you know, from a transition perspective, you know, we we, we talked about this desire and effort to to bridge the valley of uh, of of death. The uh, one of the key attributes about this program, and and one of my favorite parts, frankly, is the really close partnership we have with the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center (LCMC). Um, their, uh, their guidance is helping us to focus this overall effort and they help us build, they help build, right, really, and we help inform. As we're building the technology, 
they build an understanding of, of the transition path and the acquisition strategy to get it across the finish line. So when we're ready to go, when the technology is ready and we have that final mission uh, or initial mission ready to go and launch, we can seamlessly transition from a science and technology program into a, a transition program. And that's going to be really critical to us. OK, so that's kind of the end of my pulling that thread. You may be asking yourself, OK, so how, how, how does this affect all of us, right? And uh, let me show you how I think that's going to work out. Um, this, this graphic really represents what we in the TCO think of as a transformational science and technology pipeline. Um, it, the intent is to have a pipeline of ideas and investments that can be incubated and, and integrated to form future capabilities, essentially. So we want to have a very diverse, uh, a diverse portfolio of, of technologies and capabilities that we're, that we're tracking, that we're developing, and so forth. You know, you may see the, if you look at the graphic, you see the Vanguard programs toward the, toward the right side of this. But on the left side, we want to have, uh, we want to have disruptive technologies that are emerging. And we've, we're going to do that through reaching out to a lot of different uh, mechanisms. Um, for one, for example, uh, leveraging existing uh, small business innovative research, STTR activities, partnering even with the basic research organization, AFOSR, the Office of Scientific Re Research, um, the, and academia to find those ideas and bring them in. I've been working with the director of AFOSR to, to, to figure out how we can do that. It's not just about mature technologies. We want to get disruptive tech and, and accelerate their, their uh, application to our missions, essentially. Um, you will see specific uh, open solicitations. So if you're familiar with the Explore campaigns, Explore campaigns are explicitly launched under the TCO office as well. So they are looking at focused disruptive technologies. I'm going to show you a little bit about where in, in, in fiscal year and calendar year 21 where those are focused in a moment. Um, but you're also going to see uh, specific cyber topics and, and AFWORKS challenges that we are partnering with them where we actually uh, partner and harvest and, and award contracts based on the challenge problems that AFWORKS is launching. So using them as a, as a partner in innovation and the ability to tap into uh, small business, non-traditionals, and so forth. Um, and then you're, you're also going to see uh, that we're going to tap into what the other technology directorates of AFRL are supporting. So in terms of, of uh, broad agency announcements, science and technology contracts that they're initiating, we'll be harvesting those as well and building them into our, our pipeline of ideas. And then you, at, at some point, and we have these, we've had these as well, you're actually going to start to see these SAM announcements. And SAM is the uh, System for Acquisition Award and Management. Uh, it, it's one of the, the web-based tools that we use to actually get solicitations out there. As we get closer to being ready for application, you're going to see you're going to see those kinds of, of solicitations come into it as well. Okay. All right, so switching gears a little bit, how do we do that? Um, we've got a three-pronged approach to our engagement with industry. Um, you know, one is, is periodic contracting opportunities. I mentioned the SAM.gov opportunities. You will see Small Business Innovative Research, STTDR uh, solicitations that we will, get, we, that we will um, uh, release. Um, both in our partners in, in the rest of AFRL and in AFWORK specifically. Um, we'll be informing industry IR&D through a number of events. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues is today, of course, we're in an open environment, but one of the important aspects of what we do is the ability to have discussions at the classified level with industry. So we sponsor an annual strategy interchange meeting. This is, historically, it's been out at Andrews Air Force Base to bring folks in and, and share an awareness at, at classified levels of where the department is going, where the challenges are, and, and actually give one-on-one -on -one opportunities for industry to talk to us about how they may have ideas and solutions to meet some of those capabilities. Um, we've also had, and by the way, we, we, we advertise those through the Defense Innovation Marketplace, so the DIM is, uh, is, is the place to go to find those. It, it's annual, it's typically in the, uh, the late spring time in, 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 uh, at Andrews. Although we are evolving that, frankly, based on feedback from industry. And, and uh, you know, I've also got our engagements with Dayton Defense and uh, in, in things like Right Dialogue with Industry. One of the things is we pulsed uh, industry. One of, the, one of the things that we found that was, that was highly desirable was to get access to classified threat briefings and classified future force projections. 
And so we've enabled those in our, in our WDI uh, engagements at the classified level and, we'll be, and, and, and always have rolled those into our strategy interchange meeting at, uh, at, um, uh, in DC as well. And then continuous dialogue. So we have gotten uh, upped our ante, so to speak, on the ops tempo of press releases and social media. And we'll, you know, we'll be out at Air Force uh, Association next week, in fact, um, uh, sharing ideas and giving it a chance to talk with industry as well. OK, so some of the current, I mentioned that we've been working uh, in partnership with AFWorks. These are some of the uh, ongoing uh, solicitations or recent solicitations that have been out there. So um, reimagining energy and high-speed vertical takeoff and landing, these are, these are aspects that can fuel, well, in some cases literally with energy, um, future force ideas. Uh, many, of the, you know, many of the things we're looking at are expeditionary operations in the future. Um, if we're going to be expeditionary in our operations, we have to have energy that follows us around and is robust and portable and so forth. So partnering with, our, with, with AFWorks in, in a number of these different uh, areas. And then we've got a number of future uh, planned topics that you can see there that have kind of come out of our planning process. Things that are looking at runway independent platforms. Um, looking at uh, operations at scale, so things like how do you how do you command and control a large force that may and your command and control may be very distributed, for example, and how you do that, and a lot of aspects of space because again we support the space force and one of the one of the focus areas that I, I anticipate seeing by the end of the year is probably something in the space logistics area that we'll be releasing through events like this as well. Okay, in summary, um, as you can see, I think we're making some pretty significant changes in the AFRL ecosystem. We, we, are, we are really shifting resources very significantly to address these, these focused future force needs. Um, the TCO is going to be a focusing element for the, the research lab at large in, in doing that. Um, and again, the, the, the basic mantra is engaging, engaging operators and other acquisition stakeholders. It's really about the sooner we get our stakeholders that will ultimately use or acquire these capabilities, the sooner they become part of the team uh, and become supportive and understanding of the capabilities you're trying to generate, the, the better that's going to be ultimately for transition and focus. And this enterprise approach that, that enables these different business models that, that I talked about there on the right side of the chart um, is really turning into a powerful capability for us. Uh, and then finally, I'll add, uh, it, for those of you that have worked with, with me in the past, um, since our stand-up of our original office, SDPE, in, in 2016, we've always been focused on, on industry as a critical partner for us in these, and that's why we have these classified and unclassified events throughout the year and, and each year to engage industry, share the challenges that the department is facing, so that we can have a common understanding of the challenges, um, share opportunities to gather ideas, um, share solicitations for we need contracted research and development and analysis and other things as well. So uh, that's been a passion of mine since standing up the SDPE office and now the TCUL office as well. So again, that, so that kind of completes the, the discussion here. I, I think potentially, I guess we could have maybe five minutes to, to have any questions and answers. Yes, sir. I think uh, you're uh, not mic'd up, so maybe I'll stand at the podium and then I'll ask them from afar. Sounds good. Um, so we got uh, a series of questions, and, and don't forget the, the uh, QR code and the link still works, um, so you can use that. But we've got a couple, and obviously with the caveat that you'll, you'll answer what you can and you'll defer what you must. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, so first question, how does the Navy's MQ-25 and the RAF's uh, Royal Wingman program interface with Skyboard? Oh, so Air Force Research Lab has a number of collaborative international programs. So I think in general we're working not only domestically with the Navy but with the, the, the UK and, and Australia and other, other partners as well. Um, specifically, Skyborg does not have that particular connection yet, but the laboratory at large does, and I think that's a, certainly a possible future extension of it. Uh, next question, uh, will uh, CIBR, Small Business Innovative Research, uh, Phase 3s, be part of Skyborg? Um, I, it's hard to say whether that's going to be... Um, CIBR phase threes are a powerful tool for, for the department. Um, it, 
it, it's hard to say exactly from a future acquisition point of view how that might tie into Skyborg at this point. So we got another question, and I think it was cut off a little bit, but um, under uh, Chief Brown's um, Accelerate, Change, or Lose, how do you envision the feedback loop uh, to ensure a, a refresh of ideas once they're in sustainment and back to the TCO? Do you see that as a life cycle in and of itself? I'm kind of extrapolating. But do you see it as a life cycle in and of itself, or is it going to be, you know, how do you break the throw it over the wall. Yeah, I think there's probably two parts to that. So one is, it, you know, my example of Skyborg. Um, Skyborg itself has a DevSecOps kind of an approach to developing the autonomy, adding new capabilities, new new. Think of it as 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 adding new mission capabilities to it over time. So we're going to have a con and, and by having a common baseline for that that autonomy core system we can rapidly push those capabilities out. So in, in general, we're looking at how we make, we create systems that themselves are far more agile and, and able to accommodate changes in the future force. Um, and then in, in the broader sense, as a TCO, we're constantly looking at evolution of our own capabilities, evolution of peer capabilities, and, and looking at the delta and understanding where do we need to make investments to meet that evolution and stay ahead of it, in fact. So that's a constant uh, loop for us, if you will. Great. Okay, and um, let's see. Well, um, how does Air Force contracting provide AFRL TCO the ability to change slash impact the narrative that the U.S. and DOD will fall behind China? What is the best way to win? Um, I, I'll say this without getting too specific. We have a fantastic contracting shop that is incredibly responsive and uses the full range of contracting mechanisms that are available. I've seen that same kind of, of responsiveness in our partners in LCMC as well. So I'm very optimistic about our ability to get things done contractually. I know that it hasn't always been the case, but I'll, I'll tell you, of the organizations we're dealing with, we're in a very good place when it comes to that. Okay, um, we got uh, time for one more question. If we'll, uh, 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 but we don't. I think we've exhausted the questions at this okay. point. So, final word to you: the, what what should industry be thinking about? Um, obviously, you gave them some opportunities to participate. Do you have an idea of when the next date is scheduled, and will it be virtual or? Uh, uh, the, 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 the classified one will be probably in the uh, April time frame. And actually, one of the lessons we learned is we did it partially uh, virtual last time, and it, that was really well embraced. So we did partial, partial virtual, partial in-person at the classified level. And um, we're actually baking that into the process because it was really liked. So we can get er information out early, uh, unclassified, to a much broader uh, group. Because you know once you get into the Andrews Smart Center, you got about 200 plus people that that's all you're going to get in there, right? But, but before that, we could share with a larger community. So expect to see more of that. Um, that'll be in the April time frame, most likely. Excellent. All right. Well, sir, thank you so much for joining us here at uh, AFSIA and the WITS Summit. And I uh, appreciate your insights and appreciate your representing AFRL. So okay. thank you. Uh, please give them a round of applause. Thanks, everybody.